your next speaker is Thomas. Hello, Thomas. How are you? Hello, I'm good. Thanks. Yeah, Thomas, uh, you talk about serverless, and he is the CTO of Address Cloud, where he leads research and development of geographic risks and location intelligence services. Yeah, and Thomas, your turn. Brilliant. Thanks. Just gonna. Share my screen. How's that? Looks good. Great. So um, thanks everyone for joining my talk. Um, and uh, as has been said, my name is Thomas Holderness and I work at Address Cloud. Um, and today I wanted to talk to you about our experience at Address Cloud of um, running our software as a service business on 100% serverless architectures. So um, a number of Phos4G events now, um, Phos4G UK Online last year, I think, Phos4G at Bucharest. Um, I've zoomed in to our architecture and talked about very specific um, configuration and use cases of free and open source tools like PostGIS and data formats like cloud optimized GeoTIFFs um, and how we're using them to sort of um, to serve large amounts of um, geographic data in response to customer queries. And the focus of this presentation is to kind of take a, a step back or, or, or zoom out a little bit um, and think about actually how what's our experience been like and kind of share um, our experience um, and kind of advocate a little bit for some of the things that we've done and also kind of give um, a heads up on some of the challenges that we've had. Um, because I think this space is only, only going to see more um, investment um, in the future going forwards. So there's six things that I'd like to talk to you about today um, that are kind of facets of our serverless experience. Um, the first is cost. Um, I was involved in a Twitter question, a Twitter um, uh, discussion a couple of months back, and someone was like, "Yeah, but what is the cost difference between running virtual machines or running um, a suite of Docker containers or running EC2s or even physical machines versus a serverless architecture?" And that's quite a hard thing to to measure and to, to, to quantify, but um, I've got some examples that I'm going to work through because I think that for any business that's running um, a service, you know, the, the cost of the of cloud infrastructure is key. And then we move on to scalability, and this is hand in hand with cost, really, because um, you need to understand the capacity of your system to know what throughput your customers can get from your service, and you need to be able to deal with that maximum throughput. And related to that is latency. Um, you need to know that as your customer um, demands increase upon your service, that you're going to be able to, 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 to respond to those queries um, without the latency increasing. And at the bottom here, we've got service. Um, and by service, I mean what service can we offer our customers and what is the quality of that service? And is the, is the service that I'm offering um, actually benefiting because of this serverless architecture? We're going to look at infrastructure as code, which is one of the challenges. And it was great to see in the previous presentation some examples of a Terraform plugin to deploy GeoServer. That's really cool because we use Terraform as well. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about why we chose that and, and um, how that was really a key kind of um, learning experience for us about adopting this kind of serverless architecture. And then lastly, observability. So if I haven't got a physical machine to log into, it's really important that I can observe that my system is responding in the way that I think that it should be, that the latency isn't increasing, that the scaling is happening, and that the costs aren't spiraling out of control. So that observability piece is really key, and I'm going to show um, just our flow line of how we do that, um, which might be helpful to some of you. But it would be remiss of me to um, not talk about geospatial um, at a geospatial conference and maybe even show um, a map or a screenshot of a map. And so for those of you that haven't heard of us, I just wanted to really give a brief overview about um, Address Cloud because it really sets in context a lot of the things that I'm going to talk to you about. So the first um, thing you should know is that we're a software as a service company. Um, we're small and there's five of us. We're based in the United Kingdom. We're 100% employee owned. 
Um, and we work in the insurance sector, um, in financial services with banks, um, in logistics, um, and also in property survey. Um, those are kind of our key markets. We do about 10 million transactions a month. We have about um, 400 users of our of our system. And we power some um, well-known brand names here in the UK. So um, if people are um, getting an insurance quote, then lots of that processing is, is coming to us. And the reason that that is the case is because we really provide two key services. We provide geocoding, so entering an address and getting a location back on the Earth's surface. And we provide property intelligence and, and a geographic risk assessment of that property. I'll show some examples of that in a couple of slides. So it's really important to our customers, we've got quite strict service level agreements with them, that um, our transactions are being processed really quickly um, and that they're, it's available all the time um, because um, the public are essentially using our customer systems and that's backing onto us. And if we can't resolve that piece of information, that geographic query fast enough, then that's potentially a lost customer, a lost sale. Um, so it's really important that our, our service is on and available at that capacity all the time. So um, it's kind of an infographic, of, a little bit of, of what we do. And we've got an address up here at the top. Um, and so we've taken that address in and we've geocoded it so we know where it is on the Earth's surface. And once we know where it is on the Earth's surface, then we can try to understand what sort of property is at that address. Is it residential? Is it commercial? Is it mixed use? Um, is it government property? Um, and is it a tower block um, or is it a, a family home? And once we understand what sort of property it is, we can move on to understand what perils might affect that property that an insurer um, or some um, someone in financial services might be interested in. Is that property at risk of flooding or of fire or wildfire in North America um, or of um, subsidence or earthquake? And then another kind of interesting geographical dimension that we're starting to add to the service is for insurers who are taking on that risk, how are they exposed in the neighborhood? If they start to take on lots of risks um, nearby, then if there was a flooding event, um, how would that impact them? So that's kind of what we do, it puts in context um, why we need to architect um, in the way that we do. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's a screenshot of our, one of our applications that shows a map. Um, this is for an insurance underwriter that would come into Address Cloud to, to view a risk. Um, we've geocoded that risk and we can see that we've added some layers to that map. Um, in this, this case, is um, a flood risk um, of some nearby properties. This is actually a train station in, in the city um, near where I live. Um, so we've geocoded that, we've got the point on the Earth's surface, we know what the property is, we've got some risk scores over here. Um, and so all of the um, processes that have happened behind this application, including loading the vector tiles and the raster tiles that um, power these overlays, those are all coming through um, Address Cloud's API. And we're now using um, Map Libra um, to, to, to power this um, React application, which is great. So um, I didn't want to show an architecture diagram, but I did want to kind of show how all of this fits together because it gives a lot of context to our experience. And really, it's important to note that um, we didn't lift and shift our existing solution into a serverless architecture. We've re-architected for a number of reasons, really, into a serverless architecture. So we've changed the way that our service operates. So on this slide, you'll see on the right-hand side that I've, we've got kind of four layers. And I'm going to start down here at the data layer. So we've got three principal sources of um, a data store uh, that we work with. Um, I've taught, talked at Phosphor-G in Bucharest, and you can see the video and the slides are at blog.addresscloud.com. I will share the link at the end um, about using cloud-optimized geotiffs as kind of a scalable data store um, when they're put in an Amazon S3 bucket as a way to query large, um, really large, complicated, continuous surface models and get handfuls of pixels back at any point in time. I also talked at um, Phosphor G in Edinburgh um, about how we can use Postgres to and PostGIS um, within the Amazon Aurora service to, to have a serverless and, and scalable um, PostGIS suite. We use Elasticsearch, which is hosted by Elastic Clouds. It's uh, not necessarily 100% serverless, as you say, but it is a managed service. So someone else is doing the infrastructure management for us. Um, and uh, my colleague, Mark Varley, has given a number of presentations about um, the, the, the nuts and bolts of using Elastic, uh, Elasticsearch um, as a geospatial data engine. So sitting on top of these this, these three kind of scalable data stores, um, we've got some application logic. This was originally our monolithic um, JavaScript application in Node.js. It's now split into a series of Lambda functions. Um, and one of the things that we've done is um, think about, okay, so we've got these um, supposedly scalable um, spatial data stores in the back end, but we know that there are still some bottlenecks here. We know that to scale Aurora takes um, a couple of seconds. 
So um, that could be, you know, a potential bottleneck, for example. We know that the capacity of our Elastic Cloud um, can, can scale, but again, um, there's, there's some latency associated with that. So one of the things that we've done as we've looked at the information that we've got and the service that we provide is we've actually pre-indexed lots of our data using the H3 Geospatial Index. And then we've put that data inside a DynamoDB date table, which is a, um, a serverless database offering from um, Amazon Web Services. And it's a key value lookup. So very quickly, we can look up for any known location, any known property in the country, and we can look up um, its, uh, its properties. Um, and this is kind of like an all-you-can-eat database with as much capacity and speed you could, as you could ever imagine. Um, so that's great. So it's got some logic that decides which of these to query or potentially queries all of them and hope, hopefully tries the cache first and if not falls back on these. We've got an API which manages our API keys and authentication and then we've got a happy user sitting at the top here that's interacting with that API or is interacting with the desktop application or the web application that I showed before. So that's kind of it in a snapshot. That's that's the way that um, we've set things up. Um, so let's dive in and look at some of the kind of um, experiences and advantages. So the first one kind of, as I promised, was to look, up, look at cost. It's really hard to compare sort of before and after costs with um, our serverless architecture, at least because we changed so much in the development. So what I've done is I've, I've picked two examples of things where I've tried to understand what the differences in cost would be between a serverless and non-serverless um, setup. And we could probably pick holes in some of this, but it's just kind of, um, I guess it's a, a working case study. But what, uh, what I wanted to kind of illustrate here is on the right, we've got some graphs. And this is um, queries that are coming into our vector database. And that, that database is, is PostGIS. It's hosted in um, Aurora Serverless. And we can see that um, over the month of March this year, um, we spiked um, you know, about 500 um, PostGIS queries in an hour. Um, so we're starting to tax the database. The customers come in and probably put some quite complicated um, query requests through our API. Potentially, we haven't got those um, values in the cache, or um, they're really complicated shapes, and so we've, we've had to fall back on a, on a true um, spatial query. And you can see what's immediately happened here is that um, on, on our behalf, without us even knowing about it, Amazon has scaled that database for us. It's spiked up from two um, compute units to eight compute units. And then after those queries have kind of calmed down, and there's probably some data in the cache as well, um, that, those compute units have dropped off, and we've gone back down to two. So what I've done here on the left is, so we, we spiked up to eight ACU. Obviously, we weren't using eight ACU over the entirety of the month. We were only using them probably for a couple of hours in that day whilst we saw this peak peak load. So our bill for Aura Serverless that month was $114. Now, if we were to provision capacity in a traditional manner without any auto-scaling, um, I estimate that we'd need um, a T3X large database type, so virtual machine from Amazon that's running Postgres. Um, relational database service is a, is, a, is a managed service that you can use from Amazon, but you still have to control the capacity and the scaling yourself, so you still have to do some work there. Um, and uh, I've also selected uh, an instance which allows cross-availability um, zone replication, which is something that you get out of the box with serverless. So if one of these, there's actually three database instances in this case, and if one of them goes down, the master goes down, then it'll fall back on one of the other two. And the same happens with Aurora, and I've actually got an example of that happening in a few slides time. But you can see the so the price difference, there is a price difference there, and um, you could think about there are some ways you could reduce this price probably, but the point being that because you're trying to be at capacity all the time to make sure that your customers, if they come knocking, can get that get that performance, um, you've got a four times increase in cost if you were to run um, those databases all the time. Now, you could put a load of work in there to put auto scaling in, to manage that, to think about different, different um, database um, operations or approaches, um, but the point is that you can get that out of the box here and save money um, without really having to do anything. And it's just it's just PostGIS um, under the hood, or it's PostGIS compatible at least. So that's one example. Um, the second example is um, comparing our compute capacity. So um, what I did is I added up all of our function invocations for every Lambda function that we use. Um, so this is uh, all of our environments, development, production, it's helping our customers do their integration. So it's our sandbox environment. It's all of our back office processes now, which we also use Lambda functions for. Pretty much gone all in on this. The only thing that isn't captured by this sort of processing is our data, our data pre-processing, which tends to have very long jobs that run over a couple of days. And for those, we still um, use a combination of EC2 um, instances and um, Docker instances, and those aren't, those aren't captured here. 
But for all of those, so we've done 20 million um, function invocations and Amazon has kind of come up with this magic number of said that in that one month, we had 82 days worth of computing time. So we did a lot of computing in that month um, over, that, over, that, over the month of March. And so we've got these, these 20 million transactions. It cost us um, 56 bucks, which is kind of incredible. Um, so that's all of our, that's everything that's customer facing, everything that's in development and, and every back office process that happens in Amazon Web Services um, for 60 bucks. Um, if we were to replicate that across the three services and the back office, back office services, I think um, we have this as kind of a, an estimate that I came up with today. We'd need about nine T2 medium EC2s um, to meet capacity, to meet peak capacity. You can see these peaks here. And so that would cost us a couple of hundred bucks a month. We could probably reduce that if we went for reserved instances and we had a conversation with Amazon sales guys and, uh, you know, we could probably haggle that down. But the point being that because we're not paying for this stuff to be on all the time, we're only paying for what we use, even though we're using a lot of it, it's still very cheap. So I would kind of advocate there that there are cost savings to be had, but it's got to be coupled with the way that you think about architecting your application. And that kind of leads nicely into scalability and latency. And I was a bit, I was a bit worried um, yesterday when I started writing my slides because, well, I'd left it to, to a little bit too late and I normally try to be a bit more organized than that. And then I was also thinking, we haven't really, I haven't really thought about this um, service for or any of our services operationally because we've been busy doing other things. So we've been onboarding customers, we've been improving speed, we've been adding new functionality, um, but the service itself has just been chugging away. Um, it's just been serving up those customer requests. And I think that's kind of one of the real um, benefits, the hidden benefits of choosing a serverless um, environment. So the purple graph across the top shows our geocoding requests coming in um, again for the month of March this year. Um, I've just picked it because um, March seemed to be a good month. The graphs seem to look nice. Um, so that, that's that's what we're doing. We've got to about, uh, looks like 43,000 requests over about an hour or so on, on one of the days. That's kind of the peak that month. Um, so this is that's what this activity is showing. And so it drops off in the evenings, um, you know, when, when there's a few requests coming in from customers and then it peaks again in the day when people are, are using the system to do their work. And then down here on the second graph, the red line shows the latency of that service. So we've got geocoding requests coming in across the top. Um, and what's quite interesting is that there doesn't appear to be a relationship or any similarity between the um, changing in latency of the service um, and the number of demand that's in the top graph. I'd say I would also point out that this latency graph is, um, is a smooth average. So this is by no means perfect. And um, uh, the tool that we use here, I, I, I could have dived in more and seeing if we could get a distribution plotted on this graph, but I didn't quite have time before this. But you can see that you know our peak latency is still an average of 240 milliseconds. Uh, and our fastest response time was about on average about 80 milliseconds over the month. So it's pretty good, we're well within our SLA for our customers. Um, and we're able to gobble up these increased um, transaction loads of bits, these big jobs that customers are chucking at us and, and we've got no sweat about the latency. Um, so service, what does that mean? Um, that means that um, I kind of have this metric of how many times do I have to um, get out of bed um, to deal with the, to address cards operational side of things. Um, and I'm pleased to report that it's only happened once in the last sort of 365 days. So I counted up all of our um, external API transactions and all of our um, internal services that have got also got APIs. And we did um, 142 million API transactions um, over the year across every environment, across all of our APIs in the stack, so both dev and production. Um, and uh, over all of those transactions, we had one production alarm. Um, uh, now, frustratingly, this actually happened whilst I was on holiday for the one week that I was on holiday over the summer, um, uh, actually away from, from my house, but um, it was fine. Um, still had some internet and as also a team of us, so we can also share share um, share out when these events happen. So we've only had one event and what happened was our Postgres database um, experienced intermittent connectivity for an hour. And that was because Amazon had made some um, configuration errors or had some configuration problems in a couple of their data centers. So what they did without us even having to do anything is that they, that master node was in, an, was in a data center that was having problems. They shifted that master node to another data center, um, still in the same region, but um, up to 100 miles away. They shifted that across uh, and then they started to, to, to split the traffic over. And actually, because of the way our application is architected, we didn't, um, none of our customers um, um, even noticed that there, that there was an issue. This was just something that was picked up by our internal monitoring. Um, and they had that fixed within the hour and within about 30 minutes, um, we actually saw the, the error rate decreasing. So kind of an example of 
all of that stuff going on throughout the year and you know we're all busy people and we're all kind of building our services or running our projects or trying to deliver the deliver tools and contribute to FOS4G um really nice to be able to to know that um kind of in safe hands of the cloud provider for most of most of the work and that um that really they're taking the lead and responsibility on maintaining that uptime so lastly, sort of the five of the six things to mention, um, infrastructure as code. Um, this was a steep learning curve for us and something that we started a couple of years ago, so a long time before we went fully serverless. Um, we chose to use Terraform um, for a variety of reasons, but predominantly because it, um, it's very robust, um, it's declarative, which I really like. Um, and uh, it also supports more than just AWS, so you can use it for, to configure lots of different types of inf infrastructure, which is great, in lots of different clouds. Um, and so we actually ended up, but we actually ended up investing a lot of time in this, um, building our own um, deployment pipeline so that we understood what went on, making sure that we could version control all of this infrastructure which we've defined inside Amazon Web Services, so that at any point in time we can see exactly um, who has changed what and what our infrastructure um, is represented. So we've got lots of code files that represent all of the suite of tools that we use and how they're all connected together. Um, and we can ship that as part of our CI CD process. So a, a developer can come in, make a commit either to a logic change in the application or to some infrastructure, push that to GitHub, have some tests run. If everything passes, that gets pushed to Terraform. Um, if everything passes there, that actually gets deployed against our infrastructure. And we've got a process of making sure that we, we're happy with that in the development um, stage before that gets pushed to production. And I've written about and talked about this in the past. You can grab that blog from our website. And then lastly, observability in the last couple of minutes of this presentation. Observability is really important when you're thinking about a serverless application. And I think it shouldn't be thought about as an afterthought. It needs to be thought about as part of your ongoing IT or business processes. Because you don't have a normal server, you know, coming from our traditional monolithic application where we were backing onto PostGIS and Elasticsearch and we just had this thing that was running queries, we could dive into that box or those boxes and we could grab the logs and see how those queries were, were running and what queries are being executed. Obviously, um, in lots of the with lots of the tools that we work with, we, there is no physical box or virtual box that we can log into. So we need to capture those logs if there are any. We need to capture the metrics around those transactions. Ideally, do some of that end to end. It's not something that we do, um, something that we do well, but something that I think we could um, definitely improve upon. So we want to capture all of that information. And then we want to be able to interrogate it so that we can actually query to understand uh, what, what was going on. And we can produce some of the graphs that you've seen in this presentation. So there's a few different ways of doing that, and this is the way that we chose to do it. We use the Postman library. Um, they have a, a, core, a core module, a library called Newman, which is Apache licensed, an open source bit of kit. We took that, we wrote some code around it to run test, a test suite against our API that's running every 60 seconds or every 30 seconds. Um, and that's, that's, make, that's running all of these tests, and we're pumping those logs into uh, an Amazon tool called CloudWatch so we can see, see how those tests are performing. We can grab those metrics and those logs into Grafana, which is another open source bit of kit, and that allows us to, to see in real time what's going on. And if any of those graphs are over a certain threshold for a given period, then Grafana sends us a ping via PagerDuty, which is what, um, which, what, what wakes you up when you're on holiday. So um, that's kind of how we've architected our observability. As I say, lots of different ways to do this, but just wanted to make the point that it's, it's a key thing about thinking about, and it's not necessarily an easy challenge to solve. So um, in summary, um, we're a big advocate for serverless because we've managed to re-architect our SaaS application to serve the needs of our customers and to serve the needs of our business and for us to be able to continue to scale and to operate at scale and have low latencies and, and basically make sure that we're doing what we need to do um, to make our customers happy, which is kind of the key goal. And really, um, I'm happy because we've managed to take some of the best bits of FOSS um, that we've been used to using, be it GeoJSON, Tiles, Cogs, um, Factor Tiles are in there as well. Haven't talked about those today, but maybe another presentation. We've combined all of that kind of best bits, but we've managed to get it together in, in, a, in, a, in a nearly pure play um, serverless architecture in AWS. And um, hopefully, we'll continue to grow and we'll be at FOSS4G next year as well. So um, that's me. If you've got any questions, then um, you, put, you know, pop them in the chat or feel free to send me an email. Thanks very much. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, I have one question. It's a personal question. Yeah, it's. Uh, I imagine you collect data from several internal, external sources. How is the 
ETL process to keep everything up to date? Is everything serverless too? Well, that is a great question. And um, traditionally, no. We had some, we had a, a series of scripts and we were running those on an EC2 box. Um, what we're actually have just building at the moment this month, um, Mike has joined us and he's um, built some tech using um, AWS Batch, which is um, a Dockerized um, batch processing tool where you can have a queue of tasks uh, and then you can have a fleet of instances that run um, Docker containers. And so he's doing some brilliant work at the moment to um, basically operationalize that process so that exactly that so that all of those ETL processes don't have to be run manually um, or semi-automated in a semi-automated manner as they are now, but can actually, we can just have a queue of tasks. They can be triggered by different events or by different time periods and they can go grab the data and they, they can then wait for the availability of the processing pool and then they can, they can crack on um, and then they can be pushing the data artifacts out into um, the testing uh, environment and then eventually to production. So that's something that we're working on actively at the moment. But yeah, it's an interesting problem to be, uh, interesting problem to have. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question is, did you find AWS Lambda code is sometimes hard going what with library size layers and et cetera? Yes. It, that is a that's a great challenge. Um, we did we do for um, for the smaller functions that are in in JavaScript. We just we use Webpack to compile down that code to basically build a, a JavaScript executable, if you like, that then gets uploaded. Um, for big geo libraries like the stuff that we do with Raster, I actually gave a it's on the blog, but we talked we gave a talk about it um, earlier this year about Amazon's new um, Docker container Lambda. Um, environment where you can use a Docker image instead of um, packaging up um, using sort of traditional packaging tools. Like instead of having a zip file, you can create a Docker image. And I've actually did a demo of using, and we're actually using it in production now, the Do a Docker image that builds um, Rasterio so that we can use Rasterio in Python to do our um, query, our, our cloud optimized GeoTIFFs. Um, and that's working really, really well. It's actually slightly faster than the traditional Python zip file method um, operationally. Okay, you have time for another question. Well, do you think serverless architecture could work for latency sensitive applications like the vehicle routing that typically really keep a graph in memory for quicker response? Um. Yeah, I think, I mean, anything where you've got a, so you've got like a stateful transaction where you're reliant on a server side process managing state on behalf of a user's process um, is going to be trickier with a, with the sort of traditional API gateway and, and Lambda um, architecture that I've shown. Um, that being said, I think you, you know, there's a number of options of things um, that you could do there about, okay, why, why do you need to keep that um why do you need to keep that thing in memory? Um, and, or is there an in-memory cache like memcache that you could use to store that um, to sort of back onto there? It's an interesting one. That's something that I've never exp experimented with is, is API gateways um, socket sockets. So as well as just doing like RESTful interactions, you can do um, long, longer lived connections. And I think that that would be really interesting um, to sort of play around with that. And to say, if you've got a continuous connection between machine and your service, you could stream data between the two. But what the back end would look like that, I, I don't know. I haven't thought about it. Okay. Thank you a lot for your answer, Thomas. Uh, did you have anything more to do to, to talk? No, that was brilliant. Thank you. And thanks for everyone for joining. Okay. Thank you.